Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a panel today. We are going to talk about um, what's next for open source and particularly in terms of funding open source and who pays the maintainers, who pays the other costs associated with developing open source software. Um, I'm Emily O'Meara. I'm going to moderate this panel. I am a consultant, a product strategy consultant for open source companies. I host a podcast called The Business of Open Source. And I also um, founded a conference called Open Source Founder Summit for founders and leadership of companies that are built around open source projects. Um, with me, I have Matt, who is the founder of Cofied, um, and also one of the co-founders of Jetstack, which was later acquired by Venify, later acquired by CyberArk, and is behind the Cert Manager project. Then we have Deepthi, who is an, a software engineer at PlanetScale and one of the maintainers of ETES. We have Ashley, um, who is at Venify as a software engineer and is one of the maintainers of Cert Manager and is a Cert Manager nerd. And then we have our evil mastermind. Um, then we have William, who is one of the creators of Linkerd and the CEO of Buoyant. So to start off, um, I'm going to ask a question, uh, which is we talk a lot about monetizing open source. So my take on this is that monetizing is actually the wrong word to use when we talk about open source, because to me, when you monetize something, uh, you're getting a little extra cash, like 100 bucks here, 100 bucks there. Um, to me, I think we should talk, we should change the, the conversation to building a business around open source. And I'm curious to have your, your take on what you think of as the difference. And when you think like the difference about build, business building versus monetizing and that relationship with open source, what do you think? Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to start us off. So um, my background, as Emily already said, is that I worked on uh, the you know, part of the, the, the CERT Manager project. And obviously, congratulations on the graduation, which I think just happened this week. Um, yeah, fantastic. Um, but yeah, the, really, uh, we took a very um, sort of non-traditional route, I, I, I guess, in the sense that Jetstack was not a VC-funded company. We were a sort of professional services company, and, and we were you know, users of the Kubernetes project, we were helping customers understand and use it. Um, and along the way, it was really important to us that not only were we consuming open source, but we were contributing back to the open source. So we were contributing back to the upstream uh, of the Kubernetes project. Uh, but we also wanted to find like, you know, gaps, I, I guess, where we could address that with some innovation. Um, and, and really, like, to be honest, we never thought of developing a certificate management tool, right? That was not something that we ever thought we would ever do at the beginning. But what we realized is that that was some, a gap that we could fill. Um, and yeah, quite organically came up with something where we could sort of um, address that kind of that, that challenge. I guess we took a sort of different route in, this, so in the sense that um, we had to sort of use our professional services profits effectively. We were earning revenue from our customers and we there had to use that. And there was a real challenge in sort of understanding that we've got this really popular project on our hands. How do we, how do we make sure that we can maintain this? How, how do we make sure that someone like James who started the project um, and others, we could pay them effectively to, you know, to go and work on the project and to help like sustain that project and to, to grow the community, write the code, of course, but you know, do everything that's uh, yeah, just be more than writing the code, right? Which takes a huge amount of time and effort. And so I think, in, in a sense, like we we needed to be, um, you know, have have the support of others in the community. So it was important that we could also ha grow that community to make sure that it wasn't a single vendor project and that you know there was you know effectively support from 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 others. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think we did, a, I think, a really good job in, in doing that. And that was actually one of the reasons why it got donated um, you know, to the foundation. And I think you know, we can now see lots of other contributors um, to, to, to the project uh, along the way. But of course, like, you know, to your question about monetizing it, you know, when, when we did get acquired um, by Venify, you know, based here in Salt Lake City, um, back you know, what, so several years ago, of course, like we, we, you know, at the time, uh, Venify wanted to pour more investment into that project. And there is that sort of, you know, somewhat sort of tension. Like, you know, if we are going to pour in all of this resource, um, you know, we need to make sure that there's some return on that, you know, eff effectively. So I think what we try to do, though, really carefully um, is, is to manage that. Um, and I said that having a really kind of a broad ecosystem really helped with, with a set of partners. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably kind of serves the project really well today. 
Ashley, did you want to have a comment about pouring resources into the project and what, uh, what ROI you should, should look for? Yes. Um, is this, is... There we go. Hello. Um, yeah, I think uh, I really agree with what Matt said there. I think um, what's really key here is like Jetstack obviously was very generous in donating time and, and resources to the, to the project in the early days. And what actually works really well um, post Venify acquisition is that the, the incentives are directly aligned for certain managers to be successful there. So Venify's product suite, I'm not here to do a sales pitch, but the product suite, product suite is around um, observing certificates. So the more certificates there are out in the world, the better for Venify, right? Like if people have problems managing large amounts of certificates, they're going to need products to help with that. Part of the beauty is that, that that directly incentivizes us to make cert manager as good as possible. We don't need to like do anything shady or sneak anything in there. It's just if it is successful and helps people to issue certificates, then it directly incentivizes products. So I think incentives end up being like a key thing that uh, we have to look at when we're looking at monetizing open source because it's, it's sort of this symbiotic cycle, right? The, the better cert manager is, the better Venify does, and, and, and vice versa as well. Uh, as Venify is more successful, they can continue to be incredibly generous with the amount of time that they dedicate to the project. Maybe they're not generous. They see an ROI, well, and therefore they make the investment. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. That's fair. Uh, William, did you have any anything you wanted to add about particularly um, Boy. aligning incentives? Boy, do I. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so, uh, you know, Emily has heard me say this before, so, you know, apologies to have to hear it again, but I've been involved in open source, you know, since the early days of Linux when we were passing floppy disks around, like the, the lunchroom. And open, open source uh, encompasses a vast spectrum of types of projects. And I think it's to op the credit of open source as an idea that it can do that successfully. So when I was, you know, installing Linux on th out of a stack of 35, like Slackware, you know, uh, three and a half inch floppies, that was, uh, you know, that was a time for me when open source was like an act of rebellion, right? I was doing this so that I didn't have to pay any money to Microsoft, and Linux at, at that time was largely a nights and weekends, like a volunteer-driven project, and you felt like you were part of this grassroots movement, and it was like this really empowering feeling. I, you know, tried to contribute to Linux, and, you know, um, and if you fast forward now to, to the modern day, the type of open source project that Linkerd is, and that I think most CNCF projects are, are actually very, very different. They're not nights and weekends. They're not volunteer-led things. They're not, um, you know, uh, they're not these kind of like altruistic things. Uh, instead, they, they're commercial operations, ultimately. Everyone here, maybe there's 1% who's different, but pretty much everyone here was paid to be here, right? We're here because our company sent us here either because we're promoting our evil corporate products or because, um, you know, our company is sending us here to evaluate what are the, what's the technology here and what should we bring into our stack so that we can advance our business. So I think where I see these, these conversations go south is when you uh, are looking at these projects and you're saying, well, why aren't these living up to the, the ethos and, the, and, and kind of like the ideas that I'm used to with open source, you know, for, which, are, which are totally valid. Um, and I think when you, when you have that mindset and you look at what's happening with these projects and the decisions that are made are, are foreign and threatening and strange. And I, I think part of what I've, the message I've been trying to, to bring and, and a lot of the work that we've been doing on Linkerd has been to make that really explicit and to say, hey, look, Linkerd, like almost every... CNCF project has a company behind it, and Linkerd thrives to the extent that that company thrives. And we can talk about multi-vendor projects, but I think if you dig into the kind of the, the mechanics of how that actually works, there's almost always one company there that if that company went away, the project would kind of collapse, right? And none of us want that. So the, the kind of the model that I'm proposing is we, we just be explicit about that. Let's recognize that it's not the only model for open source, right? And there's plenty of other projects that don't fit into, into that system. But pretty much every CNCF project, with maybe, maybe one or two exceptions, but most of them kind of fit into the model. So let's, let's embrace it. Let's understand it. 
And let's recognize that's actually a really healthy thing, because that's the reason why we have so many, you know, we all complain about these projects. Sorry, I'm going to stop talking in a second, I promise. <laughs> we, all, we all complain, you know, you look at that CNCF landscape, like, diagram, and it's like looking at the, you know, the bars of a prison wall. You're like, what am I supposed to do? I've got to pick, you know, a bunch of projects, and there's 10,000. But that's actually really healthy. It's awesome, right? It means this ecosystem is really thriving. The reason it's thriving is because there's an economic relationship. And so I, I think as a community, we just need to embrace that. We need to kind of like stop pretending that we're all here for altruistic reasons. Let's stop pretending that, you know, vendors are this uh, like uncomfortable thing. We keep them in the hall, you know, and we don't really <laughs> talk about them until we need socks. Let's embrace, you know, the, the type of projects that are here and let's recognize it for the good that it is. I think uh, Vitus and Planet Scale are actually slightly different from uh, what you all have been talking about because Vitus was born at Google, at YouTube, and it was open sourced out of Google. And to give credit where it's due, Google seems to be one of those companies that has actually open sourced many, many uh, projects that they don't monetize. So there is still an element of altruism in the open source community. But if we look at how things actually evolved, Vitus is a graduated project, so we have to pretend that there is maintainer diversity and there are multiple companies behind it. But really, there is only one company that is paying maintainers to work on Vitus. So even though superficially, historically, it may look different, when you really dig into it, it actually looks very similar to any other project you might think of as a single vendor project. Even though PlanetScale did not develop the initial IP of Vitus, even though it came out of Google and was donated to CNCF before PlanetScale ever became a company, it was Vitus engineers who came out of Google and started PlanetScale to monetize Vitus. Now, I think the point Emily made at the beginning about monetization is very important. People keep talking about monetizing open source. It has been done. We know who, which the companies are that have actually managed to monetize open source project in a huge way and have made billions of dollars out of it. That is not what we want to focus on. What we want to focus on are the companies that are building the IP, that are building the projects, how do they survive? Because if those companies don't survive, then eventually there is no one backing the projects, and the community loses out on useful and beneficial projects. So I think it's really interesting thinking about Google because in, the, in terms of incentives, because Google open sources a lot of things, they don't directly monetize them, but they want you to consume cloud resources. And so there's, I, I don't think it's completely uh, altruistic on the, uh, fr from Google. Um, but moving on to a slightly different topic, you What you about talk? Kubernetes, though? Wasn't Kubernetes a totally altruistic donation? I don't know. Have you ever heard of Kubernetes hosted by Google? I was just going to add, you might argue that, you know, that it's more of a longer game right? yeah, that, that, yeah. that's being played in the case of the hyperscalers. Yeah. So although today perhaps there's not immediate monetization, they are actually building effectively the foundation. And of course, if you look at Kubernetes and now GKE. And this, this, is, this has been going on forever. I mean, Microsoft was a big uh, creator of open source projects back when people thought Microsoft was the, the big evil anti-open source and when Microsoft was publicly saying that open source was evil. So moving on to, to actually um, add to or build on what Deepthi was saying about the community and the relationship with companies, this is sometimes framed as um, a, a situation where the interests are fundamentally misaligned or at odds with one another. And I actually don't think that that's always true, and that's the question I wanted to, um, to pose to our panelists. How do you align the interests of the community and of the company that is behind the project? And why, why is that even important? So I, I would say like, it's incredibly important that there's that sort of symbiotic relationship right, between vendors and, and the community, because, because ultimately I think, you know, as it's been rightly said here, that it's super important that those vendors um, exist. They, you know, have a great deal of expertise uh, and they're able to put that resource 
um, into the community. I think if you look at some CNCF projects, they're, they're complex infrastructure projects that do require expertise. They, it, you could argue that, that you know, a, a, a team of hobbyists probably cannot fulfill, probably potentially, uh, the needs of some of those complex projects. This they, is can actually, they can complement them, This is something sure. I wanted to bring up, um, actually. Many yeah. projects today are simply not hobbyist projects. Like, if you are yeah. not spending a full-time uh, amount of time on it, you just you can't keep up. I, and I, I think I agree, and I think, with you, Willem, you made the point, there's, there's, there's just such a variety of open source. And, and the very fact that there is a variety of open source is fantastic, right? You know, I can go and find a single-use tool on GitHub that, will, that, that, is, that is staffed by a, a community. Um, uh, but yet, also, in the case of something like Linkerd, you've got a team of people that are, you know, seeing customer use cases day in, day out, and see the complexity of those use cases. And they're able to take that insight and put it into um, a, a, into the code in the community. Now they can still get complemented by the community. I, I think that they're not sort of mutually exclusive. I, I, I don't think. But I think it's really, really important for the health of some of these projects that you do have vendors that, that have successful businesses. Um, you know, perhaps with new models, right? I think we're seeing new business models form, and I, I think we will probably still continue to see an evolution in those models and an evolution in the licensing um, as well. We've already seen in what recent years. SSL, you know, um, PL, B, BSL. There's, I think there's some newer takes on how to do licensing in this open source world. But, I, but yeah, yeah, I think, I think both can sh and could, should coexist. One of the reasons it's important to have a company backing projects like the ones we have in CNCF is that most of the adopters are commercial entities. And when people are adopting something to run in their enterprise, the vast majority of them actually do want some kind of guarantees around that software. They don't want to just download something from GitHub and YOLO it. And you also have the security requirements around software that is deployed in any commercial environment today, any enterprise. And it's just not reasonable to expect that volunteers are going to worry about all of those security and compliance type of things. And those are the things that the companies backing these projects are able to give to their users that you would not get from a pure volunteer run open source project. So we are actually expecting a lot from these projects that are part of CNCF versus what you would think of as typical hobby projects. I'm going to download something and run it in my home lab. I'm building a personal website. I'm just going to get a JavaScript component of a repository. That is totally different from the kind of uh, compliance, from the, from the level of reliability you expect from something that you are running in an enterprise environment, where you're serving customers who have expectations that things will work to a certain level of quality. Yeah, that's uh, really well put. I, I think this is a really sort of uh, deep ocean that you can get into here. I think there's something really interesting about what people actually expect from these projects as well. Um, I, I, my default is to be really positive about open source. Like I, I taught myself to program as a teenager by reading open source and learning that way, right? That's why I, I work in open source now. I, I believe in it for its own sake. but. It's also important to say that like, a lot of people are incredibly entitled when it comes to the software that they're getting for free. Um, and, and part of the process of, of working on these, these, these projects is, is knowing when to say no as well. Um, Venify sponsored a long-term support release of Cert Manager as an example, um, which we were always very clear was, was a one-off uh, thing with no guarantees for the future. But we are now starting to see people demanding that we release another one, right? Um, we may or may not do that, but the, there are very clear demands um, coming from some members of the community who expect us to essentially work for free for them. I think it, William probably has quite a lot to say on this, where, where um, people expect certain things, that, and, and people hate change, and they don't want any, even if you're going in with the best of intentions and you want to make the, the most successful community possible, um, sometimes you're going to fail with some people, and that's... It's, it's, it's really difficult to navigate that situation, especially when you're coming in from a genuinely like altruistic standpoint and you genuinely believe in open source. Um, sometimes you do struggle with that, and the community can be amazing, and 99% and of the time it is. There's also that 1% of the time when it, when it isn't, and, and businesses have to 
be able to recognize that and say, I'm sorry, we just can't, we can't help this particular, this particular user. <laughs> Boy, you really, you really teed me up. Um, William's third law of human behavior is that your level of entitlement rises to what you're provided plus 10%. So, yeah, any time you have a change in behavior, any time that, you know, you get used to something, suddenly you feel entitled to that. Anyone who's worked at, you know, Google or, or Facebook or, like, any of the companies with, like, the amazing buffets of lunch every day, it's like you can, you can feel your own, like, expectations for what, you know, the quality of food that you're getting for free to be raised higher and higher, and suddenly you're, like, looking at these meals and you're like, I'm not going to eat that, you know, I'm going to go get the filet. Um, but that's, so that's just a fact of, of human nature, and, you know, it's not, nothing specific to open source, but it certainly influences how, how people interact with it, um, open source projects. I think I'm actually more, maybe more bullish on the volunteer um, style projects than, than, I, than I've heard um, from, from uh, I don't want to misquote anyone, but I, you know, I, I look at projects like, um, uh, well, Linux certainly in the early days, Git, uh, you know, the languages, Python, Ruby, a lot of these are these are volunteer, largely volunteer projects, or there's commercialization efforts that kind of come afterwards. They have these, you know, kind of BDFL people who have, you know, personalities that just attract people to kind of like to their vision. And I think that's, you know, it's awesome. I mean, those are the types of projects that we, we all make use of and, and we get tremendous benefit from. In the, in the CNCF, you know, and it's interesting to, you know, I think ask ourselves what types of projects lend themselves to, to to that model versus the model that we pr predominantly see in the CNCF, which is there's a company, you know, it's like it's it's uh, corporate open source, uh, and that's probably a whole you know podcast for Emily to explore or or something. Um, so I'm 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 not like an open source expert by any means, certainly not in this in this company. I'm really, if anything, I'm an expert in like CNCF specific open source. Um, but the original question was, what? How do we align? Um, you know, Co assuming we're in this community model, and company. yeah, assuming we're in this model where there is a company that is like primarily funding the maintainers, and I think we all agree like paying the maintainers is great, um, and there's a community, how do we align those two things? And to me, uh, you know, I think the answer is not super complicated, which is what does the community want ultimately, right? You want these projects to be around, you want them to improve, like to get better with time, you want them to solve problems. So if those are what you want, then however the the whatever economic apparatus you have behind that company or behind that project, it has to make money when those things are true. So we had this, you know, kind of like uh, hor <laughs> horrifying experience, uh, you know, for me as, as someone who's both, a, you know, heavily involved in an open source project and also trying to fund it, where we sold a lot of support contracts for Linkerd, right? And we were like, okay, this is working, this is great. And then the economy got tough. And pretty much all those customers said, you know what, Linkerd works. We haven't needed to call you. It's going to continue working if we stop paying you. So we're just going to turn this thing off. And that was a real wake-up call for me because it meant that we had made Linkerd so good that no one wanted to pay for support. Right? That was like the opposite. Our, our, our commercial opportunities were like being hampered by making the product good. So that was kind of the, you know, the moment in which I was like, all right, we need to change something here. Um, but that's, I think, an example of the type of alignment. You need to make sure that whatever, however you do it, wh whatever you're selling, the company has to make money when the project gets better. And if you can come up with a system where that works, and I think there's probably a couple options, then you'll have a project that gets better, right? And if you can't, then you have a project that eventually is going to vanish or you know, something else is going to happen. I think there is also another model for um, aligning the project and the company so that the company can still be successful. And that is sometimes there are many things that the project does well, but there are things you can do around it that don't fit into the project. Mm -hmm. And an example with Vitess, because it's a distributed database, is providing insights into what is, what is happening with the queries that Vitess is serving. That doesn't fit into the project because you have to accumulate sufficient data in order to actually provide that. So, at Planet Scale, we have a Query Insights product, which runs where we have a Kafka pipeline, we collect the data, we persist it, and then we show you what are your fastest queries, what are your slowest queries, how many times are you running them, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are not possible with the project alone, 
because it's not up to the project to provide a persistent data architecture. People have to build those data pipelines themselves. So by providing value above and beyond what the project is doing, it is possible for the company that is backing the project to actually be successful in selling something that is built around the project. And I think, Deepthi, you just hit the nail on the head with you have to provide value above and beyond whatever the project, uh, d whatever value the project does, because that's how you build mm -hmm. a company. Um, the, just ahead. to add that, yeah, if you don't go mind, ahead. Yeah. Um, but I think back to your first question, you were talking about sort of monetizing it. Perhaps in a, uh, you know, some companies might may do that more exploitatively than others. And I think to your point, if you if you are doing that, the, the other companies can, yeah, like like hyperscalers as an example, take open source projects they may not have contributed to so directly, um, and and then take that and build above it in the same way. So you, maybe that's a good thing, right? There's a level playing field. The the open source is available to anyone to go uh, extend upon. But I think it can also sometimes it can, vendors can end up losing out as well because they can be the ones doing a lot of the contribution and then have some hyperscalers, uh, not to single them out, but yeah, I mean, I, yeah, there's good examples of that, right, where they have come in and sort of mm -hmm. provided um, yeah, cloud services. And I think some of the newer licenses are trying to, to uh, they're recognizing that challenge and you know, avoiding um, those, mm -hmm. um, yeah, those, those companies can, arguably being exploitative um, mm -hmm. in, in that case and, and not giving back in the way that is fair. Mm -hmm. sure. So as a maintainer of a project, um, ha what concrete steps should you take to ensure that your project is going to have financial sustainability um, for, the, for the long term? Um, <laughs> if, I, if only I could answer that easily. I mean... Um, I think what's really interesting that we're starting to see now is, say, the German government is actually now writing checks to maintainers to, to maintain projects. Um, I think, as an industry, we might want to start to sort of look at that idea more seriously. Like, obviously, I'm incentivized to say this, right? But I, I like my job. I, I enjoy working at Venify. I enjoy working on Cert Manager. If, if I were to realistically think about going full-time maintaining Cert Manager, like, I'm throwing away a lot of security in my life. Like, I'm, I'm risking massively decreasing my, my income. Like, I've got a mortgage to pay. Like, there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into, you know, living a life that, that just volunteering on projects um, doesn't necessarily provide. I think as an industry, if we want people to sort of be able to maintain a project entirely focused on that with no, like, other commercial... Um, considerations there, we need to fund it that way. And, and the way that funding works for open source at the moment, it actually ends up being very much that you kind of end up working for a company because that's how you get to retire at a reasonable age, right? That, like, it, it's, it's, it sounds almost a bit crass to reduce it down to money, but I think that is a thing that as an industry we might have to encounter. And as I say, Germany is, is looking at that. Some organizations are working on that. I, th I think it's a an interesting discussion for the industry more widely as well. I think maintainers need to advocate for the community to give back. So uh, one of the founders of Drupal, Dieter, I hope I'm not saying the name wrong, wrote uh, an article that I keep referring back to. There are makers and takers in open source communities, and open source governance models need to evolve to incentivize makers and disincentivize takers. And we really need to be going out there and saying, hey, if, you're, if you are deriving value from our project, how about giving back? And so far, it's been in the form of code contributions, but it doesn't have to be. It can be community building. It can be documentation. It'll be really great if the CNCF could come up with a way in which adopters and users can actually sponsor projects versus it always being vendors. And in this conference, the focus is on end users. Vendors are in the sponsor pavilion sandbox. You're not supposed to talk about your uh, company or product outside of that because the conference is targeted towards end users. And the organization primarily exists to serve end users and adopters of technology. There needs to be a little bit of a shift there where end users can sponsor the projects that they are actively using and getting value out of. 
I, I, think, I think particularly like that model where it, we shouldn't just sort of see vendors as the only route, I mean, through subscription or kind of enterprise subscription. I think being, being able to contribute in other ways. I mean, the early days of Jetstack um, with Cert Manager, we were actually um, given effectively kind of some sponsorship and that, that was really able to propel us into getting some of the initial development team. So I think it doesn't actually necessarily have to be in the sort of the, the form that we're all used to at the moment. It can actually be in the form of sponsorship. I think to your point actually as well, like the, we, what, 70 to 90% I think of software now has open source in it, you know, throughout the stack. And so there's this sort of critical dependence on open source. So I think governments need to realize that, that and so, sort of support it through kind of, you know, some kind of state intervention. So there, there are other routes to funding, right, other than just purely enterprise means. I, I kind of disagree. <laughs> I think, all right, William's second rule of human behavior, which is when times are tough, especially, everyone is going to act in their economic best interest. So if there's any model, and maybe, I mean, you know, maybe I'm misinterpreting what you're saying, if your model for getting money to your project is kind of a volunteer thing, or it's a sponsorship, or it's like a please, you, you owe me, you're using this thing, then as soon as times get tough, that money's mm -hmm. going to vanish. You have to get people to put a value on your project and take it to the point where if that value is not worth what they're paying for it, then they say no, but if it is, then they have to continue funding it. That's the only model that I think really works in the long term. Uh, I actually agree with William, but also um, the other thing is go times get tough for governments too, that I think sometimes people overlook. Uh, we have time for one or two questions, if anyone. Uh, okay, you guys raised your hand at exactly the same time. There you go. That, in the green jacket, green jacket. Uh, to you, Richard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's a microphone over there, but if you just stand up and, and shout, that's... Yeah, we'll hear you. Um, so all of that was very interesting. I think there's a, uh, another aspect of open source, and I'm thinking about how um, Meta, for example, is suggesting Llama is an open source project, and the, the, the thinking and the strategy behind that, I think, is more around... <coughs> momentum behind the project rather than anything you know, you were discussing here. So I'm just wondering, do you, do you think Lama is an open source project? The, the thoughts about what Meta is trying to do with that, the, with that project? The, the question is, is Lama uh, an open source project? Who wants to take it? No opinion. I uh, yeah, no, from my understanding, I mean, it, it doesn't meet the requirements of the OSI, uh, for instance. Um, I, I think, I think the, the challenge is um, that it, it's not really open source in the sense that we've been very much used to. It's open model. <laughs> and effectively, the, you know, I'm no AI expert, but it, it's all about the, the, the weights of, of those models as opposed to all of the machinery and all of the code behind it, which is, is not open, of course, in the case of Llama, right? Um, and, and others, I hasten to add. But, so I, I think that's why I say um, earlier in the, the, the panel, I think we're going to need to re-evolve some of our licensing to take into account some of these, these newer kind of assets, right, that are not so much source in the traditional sense. But no, my understanding is that they're, they're not open. Quite whether they change that, I don't know. But um. I think, and the OSI just released a definition of open source AI uh, that Llama, I believe, did, does not meet. Um, and instantly that pretty much no one was happy with, which probably is a good sign that they, that they did a good job. Um, and uh, so I, I think that that's, uh, w when I think about it, like what is open source and what's not open source, to me it's actually a legal question. Like does it, does it have an OSI approved license or not? Uh, if yes, then yes, and if no, then no. Um, but uh, there's all these other things that are wrapped up in open source, but it, to me it's a binary and, that, and that's what it is. Um, but uh, Ashley, I think you had a... Yeah, we've got like 50 seconds. I'll have to be really brief when I throw this fireball. But I think, I think what we call open source may actually have to change in the more general sense. I think looking back at, um, no hating here, but like what HashiCorp did with Vault and Terraform, for example, um, the fact that they had a CLA which allowed them to relicense it en masse at their own direction, I'm not sure that HashiCorp, HashiCorp's products were ever actually open source as I believe it to be, like where, where it was open and free to the community um, and where people's contributions were sort of owned by them and, and maintained by them. I think um, maybe the name of these sort of business source licenses, we need to find a better one than, than open source because I don't think it is open source. It doesn't match what I believe it to be. 
Uh, I will add one. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be moderating this panel. Um, I know there's uh, a company uh, called FerretDB that has marketed themselves as a truly open source alternative to MongoDB. MongoDB does not meet the, the, that binary requirement, but MongoDB has sent them a number of threatening letters uh, telling them to cease and desist because uh, MongoDB says, no, we actually are open source. Um, and so I think there's also a, a pretty big, like especially for big players, there can be a desire to like redefine what open source means. And if they have the finances behind it to try to use legal methods to make everyone agree with them. 